as part of our tour in Cardiff, uh, we're visiting Brother John, from whom we're going to listen about his journey to Islam. Please join us. Brother John, tell me about your journey to Islam. Alhamdulillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I would say that growing up with a, a mother who was Protestant from the north of Ireland and a father that really was not not very religious person, but somebody who was open, very open to to, to uh, otherworldly experiences, shall we say? He was very interested in Eric von Daniken and are the uh, you know the aliens from other planets come and inhabit the earth and these kind of things. He was very open in that way. Um, I was brought up with this kind of, you know, um, how would I say, just acceptance, being able to accept ideas in different different things. Was he Protestant too? I think he was probably raised Church of England because he was from from the, the UK. But we, we attended Sunday school as children. We read the Bible. We It wasn't an overtly religious household that we were in. But I would always been seeking for the truth as because I came as I became a teenager and I grew up and I had friends die and the usual things that ex- happens as a person's growing up. I, you know, I began to question things, you know, well, what is the what is the truth? Were these various religious traditions that we have? Which of the books actually contain something which you could live by? What is a code? What is a um just a message in there, almost the instruction book, as it were, for a human being. And I looked at Christianity, but there were certain aspects of that which I just didn't understand. Things didn't make sense to me. And also the people that I asked about it couldn't really give me answers that made sense. I investigated, I was very interested in investigating the Hindu religion as well, because that had this whole historicity of science behind it, where you know the, the zero actually comes from from their their tradition and the numbers that even the Arabic numerals as as they use now are from India and there was this whole amazing tradition that went behind that but there was still something about the pantheists of gods that they have this whole you know range of them and each one has this different aspect and certain things that you had to be in denial of like not eating and all these other things and being vegetarian as being part of it and i mean it could have been you know stuff for like could have been that it was from the person that was telling me but i just got this overall impression that there wasn't it wasn't right and judaism was a very very hard one to try and penetrate to find anything else about other than being referred to the old testament but then finding that it was the torah was that the book, and then finding out lastly that the Torah is actually very different to the Bible. And then from searching on, I then started finding out. I thought it was the Old Testament. Isn't, isn't the Torah the Old Testament? It, it is in the fact that when it was translated from the Hebrew into another language, it was taken from that. But there are two Old Testaments. There's an oral Old Testament and there's a written one. Mm. And the two of them are slightly different, which is why in the Old Testament you have uh, God mentioned as one name and then God mentioned as another. And it's because they took the two sources and put them together, the oral and the and the the, um, the written one. So this is where the Old Testament came from. And in the Jewish tradition, from from my understanding at the time, was that the Torah was not the book that was in the in the Old Testament because it had also been made to fit, shall we say. Mm. So you were actually looking. I was actually looking, yes. Mm. And the place I ended up was actually in uh, magic. Uh, the works of Alistair Crowley and other other people like that. Um, the, the books of Gematria, which were based on the Torah, which is the, the, the Hebrew letters actually turned into numbers. 
to make magic number squares and all these other kind of things. Like what, you know, alhamdulillah, that <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to talk too much about what the actual things are because I, I don't think, you know, it would, it would actually benefit anybody from that aspect. Other than what I found with this was you had a ritual practice. There was there were certain things that you had to do to prepare yourself for these for these rituals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and it, it made sense in a completely bizarre way. It actually made sense, and this is where I was when they bombed the two towers in New York in oh, two thousand nine eleven. This is where this is where I was at the time. I'd moved to Wales, and there were some Pakistani people living just up the road from me, and. I was, as a complete aside, I was making uh, compilations of music tapes. And somebody said, oh, if you want a tape done, go and see John down the road and he'll do your tape. And so th this person came to me and said, I'd like this music done on this tape, blah, blah, blah. And I then said, oh, well, you're, uh, you're Muslim, after finding out what their name was. And um, I said, well, how do you explain what happened the other day on the TV? It says about Muslims destroying these buildings, all these people killed. And they said, that wasn't Islam that you were seeing there. That was something else. Mm. And they said, I, you know, in defense of themselves, they said, I'm going to get you a Quran and I'd like you to read it. Because again, Islam was something that I had never had an experience of, never found any information about, because I'd never met any Muslims growing up where I did in rural Herefordshire, which is on the England-Wales border. And then coming to South Wales, as I did, there were actually more Muslims here than anywhere <laughs> that I previously experienced. So they brought me the Quran, and it was the Marmaduke Pikthal one, I still have it in my bookshelf, and it read like the Bible. It used that very arcane language, but it actually resonated with me. I could actually see something in it. Was that um, Yusuf Ali's translation? Or what? It was Pikthal. the Marmaduke Pikthal one. The, Pikthal, yeah, okay. the Pikthal one with thee and thou and yes. thy, thy Lord and all this. <laughs> but it was, it was what I was used to reading, because I didn't have a very modern Bible in the house when we were growing up. And it was... It was just amazing. I'd not read a book like it, even in an English translation, you know, because it's the Quran is unique. And the reason that, you know, there's all the criticism of the Quran about it doesn't, it's not like any book, it's because it's not like any book, it's unique. And this was something that, that resonated with me, as I said. And the stories in it, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, Joseph, that, you know, I'd remembered from the Bible, but it was a much better story. It was, it actually made more sense, you know, and the, the stories of the other prophets, the story of Abraham and of Moses and all the other things were in there. But the, the prophets were treated with respect, which is something I didn't find in the other, other books as well. Because the stories in the Bible and some of the prophets and the things they say that they did, uh, you know, I, I just, yes, I can't, I couldn't actually believe <laughs> that they would put that kind of thing in there. It just, you know, um, it was shocking. So there were, there were actually similarities, but dissimilarities at the same time. Alhamdulillah, right? that's absolutely right. They were. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know more after that. And they said, well, we, we, you know, we, we've given you as much as we can. And what we would like to do is take you with us when we go to see Sheikh Hamza Yusuf giving a lecture in London. And this was in 2002, by the time, you know, the time had moved on after reading the book, etc., and um, so I went to see Sheikh Hamza and he was doing a tour. There was himself and Yvonne Ridley mm -hmm. and also two other people. And they were talking basically about how Islam and terrorism are not, not you know, um, bedfellows, as it were. They're not two things that actually exist together in, in, uh, in the, the world normally. And after he'd finished giving the talk, which I found amazing, I, I got a chance to meet him and say, listen, I'm really interested in, this, in, in Islam. And I want to learn more. What should I do? And he said, take a shahada. So <laughs> I did. So he advised you that the beginning would be the shahada yeah. rather than the end. Yeah, that was it. That was what he advised mm -hmm. me to do. So he took my hand and I recite the, the shahada, sort of took me through word by word. And as I'm doing it, I felt this wave, sort of something like descend upon me. Mm -hmm. And it sort of just went through my top of my head and went right the way down to my feet. And it was just an amazing, I've not had any kind of sensation like that before. It was just absolutely incredible. Yeah, because it, it, it was a, a huge thing yeah, to do. That's right, yes. And from then on, sort of thing has been my, my journey in Islam. And, you know, going the, the usual thing that happens to people that, that convert to Islam is I probably became very radical and I probably became very conservative. 
and I probably became not an extremist, but I was very hard and fast in my understanding. But then, you know, alhamdulillah, as time went on and I learned more, my understanding and my view widened again. And I didn't quite go, you know, as far as, you know, completely the other way, as it were, you know, like mm -hmm. a pendulum swing. But alhamdulillah, I think I went a bit over and I, inshallah, come back to the middle again. And the more I learned, the, the more, you know, um, uh, the, the more that it never ceases to amaze me, that's the thing, is, is the Islam, is that you can see what they say with the language, that it's an, they're oceans, aren't they? When you learn the language, it's oceans. Islam has these oceans in itself as well. When you look at the outside world, when you interact with different people, when you understand the Prophet Sallallahu what he went through in, in Syria, in the journey, and all of the things that happened in his life, and when you then think about situations in your own life, you can find something, there's always something there. There's a little pin in a map somewhere, or there's a person that he met and spoke to, and that there are these all things are relatable and they all join up. And it's for those things that I think that Islam is right. I couldn't find I couldn't find any holes in it. What about challenges? The challenges have been being Muslim in the UK, um, and all of your friends not being Muslim when you become Muslim. Nobody you know is Muslim, as it were, from your old life, as it were. And so you have to start disconnecting. Um, I don't, I, in, in some ways, I think I would, I would have disconnected from people that were, you know, if, if I was some, I wasn't a big drinker, but if I'd have had drinking buddies, maybe they wouldn't have been the per people that I would have gone back to because you can be drawn back that way. Yeah. Um, and if th there were people who I knew who were vehemently against any kind of formalized religion, maybe those wouldn't be people I would talk to again. But it, it tended to be that I think when people knew that I'd, I'd accepted Islam and I'd become Muslim, they tend to step back because their lack of understanding maybe was something where they had the experiences of September. So 11. you wouldn't yourself have stood back? No, no, but they but stood they back did. from me. Mm. So then the challenge was, is to let them know that, you know, I'm trying to be better. It's not that I'm trying to be different. I think the thing is that religion is always a way of life, irrespective of which religion. Yes. And once you've chosen a different religion, that's a signal that you've chosen a different way of life. Mm. And that's when people... Yes. S start seeing themselves as different. Yes. And, and also then, you know, you're learning to do things like, you know, moderate your language that you use and to be respectful to people and try and be polite and, and to try and follow that prophetic tradition of the way that you interact with people. That is another challenge as well, especially if you've not been brought up in, a, in the environment where, mm. you know, well, I mean, you know, because of the, the age and the generation that I'm from, we were taught to have manners. You always said please and thank you. You know, you you uh, you didn't take things that um, that weren't yours. You weren't um, disrespectful to your elders and those kind of things. And and this is something that you know that Islam actually encourages that people do. But the other challenges is that when you when you meet other Muslims as you go through life and you realise that some of them aren't doing this, and yes, is is how do you deal with other people? And the best thing to do is is just don't deal with other people. How ways. about uh, differences that exist within the Muslim community? Did they at all put you off at uh, times or somehow hold you back? Um, it was, I think, I think things being brought to my attention as differences in the Muslim community would be, would be a better way to describe it because I didn't realize that there was a Sunni Shia divide mm. to start with. I thought we we're all Muslims. You, 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 you accept Islam and you put on these glasses which have these beautiful tinted lenses which make you want to move to Saudi Arabia because it's a, a land resplendent with all of the Islamic traditions where people are just the most perfect people outside of Jannah and the rest of the world where, the, where Islam exists is like that. And slowly they, they, they start to get eroded and they, they, they get scratched and faded. And, and you realize that you're actually trying to look at the, through, at the world through, through you know, a, a filter. Mm. And that filter isn't actually there. It's, it, it's almost a veil in a way. Um, but 
the only real differences I've seen is when I've come to learn that, you know, that maybe Shias pray a different way, that uh, people from the Pakistani community with their following a different school of thought may, may have different traditions and different ways of uh, performing their, their, their acts of ibadah and things. So, and also people from different countries have different experiences too. So the Libyans you meet are different to the Jordanians that you meet, to the Arabs that you meet, to the Pakistanis, to the Africans. Um, yes, I'm... That's when culture and religion meet. This and... is another interesting one. Yes, mm. this was this was actually, that's probably what I... If I'd have thought about what you just said, I'd have come to that answer <laughs> a bit sooner, which is that learning how much of culture had actually got into people's Islam. Mm. It's almost like putting salt into sugar. Yes. Where you, you you look at it and you can't tell it the difference. They're both until, white. Until, yeah, they're both white, they're both crystalline, they're both... And mm. you, that's what the Islam has become. It's become like that. And so trying to unpick that in the early days was a, was a, was a big deal. How about family? Family, alhamdulillah. I have a brother who is three years younger than me that lives in North Carolina, and he is a devout Christian. He's um, a Reformed Baptist, and he has six children, and all of the children have, um, you know, very good biblical names like Jonathan and Rebecca and Sarah and things like that. And I love him to bits. He's, he's really, really good. And the kids are fantastic. And because he's from a faith tradition, they've been brought up with good manners, with mm. belief in God and everything else like that. And alhamdulillah, it's really good. My younger brother, who's 10 years younger than me, if you asked him what religion is, he'd say he was a Jedi. <laughs> <laughs> a Jedi? A Jedi, after these Star Wars films. Oh. It's, it's kind of his, his belief system is a bit like that. It was a joke at one time, but um, I don't know if he's changed now because he's, he's got older. But um, but you get along with your family. I so get along did, with my family, So yeah. you, your uh, conversion to Islam did not disrupt your uh, connection with your family? No, no, it didn't. I wouldn't say it disrupted it. My father, when he was alive, he said, as long as you're happy, that's it. That's all that matters. And my mother, as she, she's, uh, she, you know, alhamdulillah, she's, she's still concerned for me. And, she, you know, when Ramadan comes around, she says, oh, the days are not, you know, days are long and you don't drink water and things like that. Make sure you drink enough and make sure you do that. So, but, you know, and I think it's been long enough now that they've got used to it because as I say it's from it's 18 years now. So, alhamdulillah, they've, ha they've had time to get used to it. And, um, and I think also, you know, from getting married and, and the kids and everything else and the family situation, I'm probably a lot more stable in Islam than I was before. I've definitely been saved in more than more than one way, more than I can imagine, because the kind of personality that I had, I could see myself being in a lot of trouble <laughs> if um, if Allah hadn't decided on that day. It's, it's now. Subhanallah, so. I mean, uh, people who look around um, like you did uh, at, at a certain stage, Sometimes they end up with something that they feel very happy about, mm. very comfortable with, but uh, is not necessarily the truth. Mm. Yeah, and um, of course, their it's their free choice, isn't it? That's right. Yes. But uh, as a Muslim, you you can only feel sorry for them. You can, but this is what I'm saying about learning: is that the Prophet Sallallahu when they moved to Medina, when they hitched to Medina. Islam was in its, you know, they were the minority, weren't they, in charge of a majority, which went Muslim. In Egypt, when the Muslims went to Egypt and took charge of that, they were the minority, and the majority of them weren't. So Islam seems in its in its infancy to have always been in a situation where they were the minority living amidst the people who were different, but they were always able to survive and always able to coexist with them. So Islam has this unique ability where we are not antagonistic to other people. And in this country, um, we are, we're a minority here. But alhamdulillah, you know, for the Western world, that we're able to, to enjoy being Muslim in these countries, even though, you know, maybe we're viewed as being an, an other. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's still a lot better, I think, than when you look around the world at other places where people are Muslim at the moment, like the Rohingya and in Bangladesh mm. and places like that where, you know, they're not having as... Well, uh, since you became Muslim, are you seeing more people attracted to Islam? Is yes, this... yes, I am. And, and also because 
you know, the, the, the way that Allah works with it is that something you may think is a completely horrendous thing to happen, and, you know, and it is from our perspective, but it can actually open a window or a door for somebody who thinks, how would they do that? How can Muslims do that? And they go and investigate and they meet the right people or they read the right book or something happens and they think, Alhamdulillah, it's not what I thought it was. It's actually better. <laughs> so, yes, in, and I think in Cardiff, since, since I've been Muslim as well, there's been a lot of the, the masjid I've been to, every week there seemed to be a sister who'd accepted Islam very few brothers actually do. It seems to be more women. Than more women, than men. yes. Yeah. This is a, but was, I, I hear this is the trend. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> it's good. And it's um, amazing because uh, uh, some people's perception of Islam is that it's anti-women, it's not uh, fair to women. Hmm. But actually more women uh, come forward and embrace Islam than, yes. uh, than men because they find something there. Yeah. It's true. Yes, it is. And, and and as you said before, I think this is another one of the challenges: is the culture. It's it's largely the culture that is the the kind of the misogynistic element of it. You know, all the things that are bad for women is from the culture. It's not from the religion, because if they'd studied the religion, they'd see what a high position that women have in Islam. I mean, one of the one of the top five hadith relators is Aisha Radhiyallahu isn't it? She's yeah. one of the the top five who knew a, you know so much of this stuff and the. Yeah, and Maryam, she was the, you know, she's got a chapter in the Quran. So, <laughs> is uh, uh, is Britain witnessing uh, the emergence of a convert community at the moment, or are people who re- converted or reverted, as some people prefer, mm-hmm. uh, are living scattered and isolated? How is it? I, the, the converts community. I think it's actually what you might describe as a burgeoning convert community. I think what's happening now is because they're becoming more converts to Islam is we're starting to network a lot better. I think, you know, the modern technology has done this and you've got people like um, Abdul Hakim Murad mm. uh, in, in Cambridge, who set up the Cambridge Mosque, which is a much like a beautiful building. And it, high, higher profile converts, I think, might be the, a, a kind of a beacon yes. in a way. Mm. And for us to actually see that, you know, we there is a there is room also for a British Islam, just as there is, you know, a, a, what the Ottoman Empire was. That was a Turkish kind of thing, and you know, everybody seems to have Islam, but a British identity in Islam seems to be something that is developing. But it, it's the same with when they talk about the culture of a country, and you can see the traditions that they have. British traditions are maybe not that visible or not that easy to put a finger on of what we have here. Because it, when you think of it being something like tolerance and acceptance and all these kind of things that you see in the people, you may not see it um, in other places, shall mm-hmm. we say. But it, and I do think that is a core value of this country is, is that we're very tolerant. And, and tolerance is a horrible word. We're very accepting. Because to tolerate something means that you don't like it, but you allow it to happen. <laughs> Well, it's, uh, it's uh, British society, despite uh, the denial by some people mm. uh, of this fact, is increasingly multicultural. Yes, very so much it's, so. Uh, it's that's that's what makes it more accepting. Yeah, yes, it? yes, 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 yes. And I think we are seeing that, that there is more of a British identity, and with some of the television channels like um, the Alchemia one and uh, British Muslim TV and Islam Channel which have been going on, and they've been, you know, at pains to try and promote Islam in this country. And it's, um, you know, inshallah, it'll, it'll continue to get better. But we're starting to see now that, you know, like as I said, when myself and uh, my wife went on Umrah, and we met up with all of these other converts from around the world, uh, from, you know, meeting from, I'm trying to think, they were Latvians, and they were Kenyans, and Ugandans, and the Kenyans and Ugandans were amazing because... How did you come all together from, from these different places? Um, it was, there was an organization called World Umrah, and every year they organize for converts to come to Mecca and Medina and Jeddah and actually perform an Umrah. Mm. But while you're there, they like to gather your stories about how you came to Islam, about your experiences, and then they use these as... Um, 
maybe as demo material or as something else to show people. They write them down or they document them they document on video. Them on video. On video. Yeah. Yeah. And they have somebody going around with a camera. Most places you go, mm. who's videoing you doing this when you go on an excursion, they video doing that. But um, and if, they've, they've produced this in films. You've seen I them? think they have. Yes, we. Um, they sent us a link afterwards to where we could view the the the, the, the films that they were doing during the day, mm. and then at the end of the of the Umrah visit, we went to Jeddah to their one of their headquarters places, and they showed us a film of what was what was been done. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure actually what happened to it after that. If they keep it internally or if it was for external broadcast. How was but, the experience? For you? Uh, um, mind blowing, maybe might be a, a hey. yes. As uh, I was saying about this thing I have called imposter syndrome, where I meet these people who are have been Muslim for four years and they've learned Arabic and they're hafiz of Quran, and you meet somebody else who's now teaching in a school after doing an Arabic degree. There was a Russian brother who accepted Islam, went to Al Azhar for seven years and studied Arabic. Oh, has come back home and is starting an Arabic school in Russia. Okay, so then I'm thinking, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> I've been Muslim for 18 years. What have I done, really? And it, it, you feel you need to pull yourself up. And alhamdulillah, and I, and I don't know whether that spoke for everybody else who was doing it, but I, when I came back, I thought, I've got to do more. I've got to do something else. I've really got to do something. And it's a real iman boost in that way. And to me in the brothers from Kenya and Uganda who go around and they, they find a truck and they put speakers and a microphone in it and they'll go around somewhere and they'll set it up in a car park or in a residential area and they'll start inviting people to Islam. In their uh, localities. In their localities in Uganda. Mm-hmm. And the depending on the government, because at one time it was, it was Idi Amin was the was the president of Uganda. It was under a Muslim uh, or an Islamic control, as it were. I think at the time that these brothers were telling me, it wasn't. So it made it very difficult for them because the army would come along or the police would come along and move them along. But because they're predominantly Christian areas, if they found somebody who was a bishop of a gathering and he became Muslim, all of the people that were with him would become They would just follow. All of the congregation mm. would follow. And they were, and I mean, the dower work they were doing was just incredible. And the, the, the brothers and sisters who came from New Zealand, there are more, there are more mustards in Cardiff than there are in the whole of New Zealand. And all of the converts in New Zealand know each other on both sides of the islands. And yes, and the, there's one brother there who does, he goes to a car boot sale and sets up a table and invites people to, to come and read the material that are there. Um, yeah, and all of these stories as, Yes, it was just amazing to hear other people's stories. But it's more about what they were doing as well as, you know, their, their story, their journey to Islam, but what they're doing now. And uh, that was that was enlightening, it really was. So it was uh, a trip worth making. Absolutely, alhamdulillah, <laughs> yes. It's all, I don't mean to, uh, like, overscore the fact that we did Umrah because that was incredible. <laughs> but it was the, all of the, the other thing that supported it as well was was absolutely amazing. The whole thing, you know, and being taken care of by... But the organization and the hotels that we went in, the trips they organized for us to do as well during the during the day where we visited various sites around Mecca and Medina. And yeah, it was just uh, that once in a lifetime thing that you will never forget. It's one of those experiences that you never forget it. And it's the kids sometimes say to me, what was the, what was the best day of your life? And I say, it was taking my Shahada because that's something I will never forget. I even remember the day the date and the time and where it was, but I couldn't for the life of me take you there. I just remember it was in a church, <laughs> which they were using for the conference. Mm. Yeah, that was... Uh, well, Brother John, it's uh, been really delightful talking to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Indeed.